working? Brilliant. OK, so yeah, so thank you very much um, for the invitation to speak. Like I say, it's, it's an absolute pleasure to be here today. Uh, my name is Jenny Moffat uh, and I'm a faculty developer and educationist based at RCSI University of Medicine and Health Sciences. So I'm over in uh, not so sunny Ireland today. We had a lovely uh, run of it. I think our summer is finished now. We have four days and uh, we're very grateful for that. Um, and the university that I work in, is very much uh, an interprofessional mix of we have uh, programs in medicine, uh, nursing, dentistry, pharmacy, physicians associates, um, research, masters, PhDs, you know, everything under one roof. And so my job at RCSI as a faculty developer is I, I run the teaching and learning program. So we have all of these marvelous professionals that come into us that are really, you know, expert in their content area. Um, but when they come to actually learn to teach, uh, they come and they join our diploma and uh, get all of the kind of the skills and the practice and build their teaching identity um, over a one year course. And a little plug there, uh, we've actually opened Open that up to external students uh, just last year so um, we're currently recruiting for that at the moment. So that's one part of my work at RCSI. The other part is to get involved with teaching and learning innovations and research around that and this brings me into the field of escape rooms and I've actually been looking at how to use an escape room to help medical students learn about managing uncertainty that they might meet when they go out into practice um, and so what I have for you today is really a little bit of a hybrid um, of both of those areas. So how do we actually, um, you know, build an escape room that really optimizes learning? So what I wanted to do first is ask a quick question of you and just to find out a little bit uh, of who is here. So I'm going to stop this share here. I'm going to be really experimental uh, using a Mentimeter in Teams uh, oftentimes isn't quite uh, a seamless as I like it, but I'm going to go in uh, and let's share the screen on that. So if you uh, want to open another browser window um, or pull out your mobile phone and go to uh, menti, menti.com, I have a little poll open there. And when you visit that site, it'll ask for a code and the code uh, you see at the top there, it's 8404. 5935 and um, it'll allow you to vote. So I'd just love to know your kind of where you're at with education escape rooms. Have you made education escape rooms? Have you played them but haven't ever made them? Uh, or you're in that area of just getting started. So it'd just be lovely because there's a real exciting group of people here today uh, just to find out uh, where you're at. And hooray, my poll is working. Phew. Fantastic. Lovely. So that's a really interesting mix. I thought we were going to have kind of um, more of the middle and the right, but we've actually got quite a few um, developers here who created their own es escape games, which is fantastic to see. Um, if you're only just getting started as well, you're in the right space too. Um, I've designed this uh, um, designed the session to actually, you know, kind of tick boxes for people who are in each of the different categories. So that really, really helps me to see who's here today. So I'll just uh, back into my slides. And hey. Oh, is that sharing for you? I don't see my little red. Not yet. Not yet. OK, let's go back and do that again. Share. Window. Uh, that one. OK. Lovely. So I heard um, Daisy mention there about uh, games uh, for learning and the kind of the power of play in learning. Uh, and just to check there, Carol, are you seeing my uh, kind of a side with three frames on it there? Yes. Yes, lovely. Um, so Daisy, I, I heard you mention about uh, play for learning and absolutely this is bang on the topic uh, that we are here today to talk about and the power of play in supporting learning. I mean, we know from our own inherent experience, uh, we know from studies of civilization, we as a human species, 
we, we learn through engaging in play and children in particular will learn a lot about, uh, you know, their family and their community and uh, the skills that they need in their daily lives through engaging with play. Now, because I'm from a veterinary medicine background, I always have to sneak in a picture of a cat as well. So just to remind us that we're not the only species that learn through play as well. And we see that particularly with young uh, mammal species. Again, they're finding out how to work in their pack, how to work in the pride, uh, you know, how to uh, grow into their bodies. And that is actually uh, mediated uh, through play. So as we become more, um, and uh, I'm just going to zip onto that one. Just find my little cursor there. As we move into a more sophisticated idea of learning through play, and I, I would say particularly what we've seen catalyzed through the pandemic is that ability to harness digital and online learning for gameplay. And as we do that, we're starting to see quite a bit of research building around uh, how learning takes place in the online setting. So it's something that's it, it's a really exciting field. Um, however, it does come with a few uh, caveats. And I'm wondering if anybody's ever heard of the, the term chocolate covered broccoli. Now I do, uh, knowing that there's quite a few of us in the room today that's actually engaged in building educational games, uh, it may be something that you've come across. And that is the sense that uh, sometimes when we create an educational game, uh, when our students or our learners engage with that, they are like, oh, you know, this is really fun. This is, um, you know, kind of tasty. This is nice. And then they hit the learning bit and they like oh so I was talking to my nine-year-old about this today and I, 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 talk, I told him about chocolate covered broccoli and he said oh yes mommy that's whenever we play a game um, that the teacher wants us to play and it's worse than a normal game so you know out of the words uh, out of the mouth of a nine-year-old uh, and then we had a great conversation about chocolate and what that would look like uh, so there's this idea that Educational games can sometimes uh, not quite hit the mark because they're maybe not as fun as what the learners um, would um, experience, especially compared to commercial games. Now, there's also the risk that um, we have the flip side of that. And what I have for you here is some beautifully healthy looking muffins. Uh, there's fruit in them. Uh, and I don't know, I, I really struggle to get fruit and veg into my kids. So I trick myself into saying, yeah, well, there's one of their five a day. They're having a blueberry muffin. But actually, uh, if you look at what's nutritionally behind that muffin, it's high in fat, it's high in sugar, but there's no nutrients in there. So uh, not so healthy muffins. Uh, and I, I actually, um, that's not as exciting as term as chocolate covered broccoli, not quite as successful. But hopefully what you can see there is that there is the risk also with our educational games that they're actually fun and engaging and the students like them, but they're nutritionally empty. They're not ticking the box uh, for the learning outcomes. So I think specifically with escape games, because they, there's so many elements of them that are exciting, they're curiosity provoking, they're often team based and set towards a clock so there's urgency to them there's competitiveness so the students are all in they really get into it and get immersed in it um, but are they learning and I think that's one of the key places that learning theories uh, can, can come in and help us so that's a, a way of leading into you know what we're going to do in this session and I would like to uh, you know say by the end of the session I would hope that you would be able to uh, know why learning theories are important and uh, you know really valuable in constructing our educational interventions um, talk about some of the theories that might be relevant to escape games uh, and then also how to practically apply a learning theory to your own uh, escape game. Uh, and as I say, so if questions come in, I have uh, there's time. I think Car Carol's let, uh, give me lots of time for questions at the end. But, you know, if things do come up and in the chat box, there. I can't see the chat box. But Carol, if something uh, urgent comes in, uh, don't be afraid to just unmute and come in. No I have another poll and uh, let me just sneak into that one. So I'm just going to stop that share there and. We'll do another. on that. No, I'm going to close that one. And this is the dreaded question about learning theories. OK, so the same thing again, if you go to menti.com and put in the code 8404 
5935. Um, how, how like you is this statement? I have an excellent understanding of learning theories. Lovely. It was a real mix on this one as well. Brilliant. Lovely. So that, that implies to me, again, you know, we're a, largely a group of educators and concerned with education. So I can see that as quite a few people in the very like me and like me, which is brilliant. And um, if you're in the not like me or not at all like me, that's absolutely fine as well. That is uh, certainly whenever we have our new doctors and nurses coming into the programme and they really don't have a lot of understanding around learning theories, uh, we can definitely do, um, uh, you know, work around that and, and, and build around that. So that's brilliant. That helps me again. Um, and we'll pop out that. And back into that. Okay, lovely. So thank you for sharing that with me. So what we'll do, we'll just kind of go back to basics on this. Uh, and I always like to start uh, with a definition. And so if you were to ask what is a learning theory, so a theory is a comprehensive, coherent and internally consistent set of ideas about a set of phenomena. So if you went out into the street, uh, not my street because there's uh, I'm, I'm surrounded by cows and sheep and there's no people out there. But if you found a street with a lot more people in it and asked each of them, you know, what is learning and how does it take place? You're going to get a really unique uh, set of answers. So everybody has kind of a different idea of how learning takes place. And oftentimes it can be very tailored to our own um, experiences and, you know, how we were taught. But if we can actually um, create a shared mindset around learning and come to a kind of an agreement to how we hypothesize, how we imagine that learning takes place, because it's actually very hard to say exactly how it does take place. You can see that different themes or different ideas emerge and people will adopt different stances or perspectives on how learning takes place. And these are largely um, kind of can be categorized um, in uh, theories and different types of theories around learning. Now, again, when I start out uh, teaching around learning theory, I use this image here. Uh, this is an infographic by Richard Millwood, um, and I would say uh, usually gets two reactions. I usually get the, wow, there's so many of them, and also complete panic response. Oh my God, there's so many of them. Do, do I need to know all of these or what are these? Um, so, so this image, you really don't know, need to know anything about the individual learning theories from this, just to know that there's a huge variety of them. Um, and they come from different places, they come from different backgrounds, and um, there can be connections and relationships between different theories. Some theories will sit underneath a, an umbrella theory and, and they change as well. They change over time. Uh, some theories persist, uh, some fall out of fashion, new theories arrive. Uh, and oftentimes if you go to a, a, an education conference, or certainly a medical education conference, you'll have people, you know, uh, quite conflicted about what each theory means. So there can be a lot of uh, discourse and dialogue around theories. And similarly, you get these very big words. They can be quite jargonistic. Uh, you know, here we've got constructivism and cognitive flexibility theory. And if you are starting out as an educator, um, that can be a little bit overwhelming. So, you know, I always say it's a little bit yikes uh, to get started with learning theories. Um, in the session that we have today, I won't be going into the theories in detail, but if you are setting out and getting started with a learning theory, I'm going to offer you some resources that are great gateways into that. But fundamentally, uh, what I want to kind of express is that, you know, when you when you start out teaching and when you start out building an escape room, you might come in at this quite, um, you know, a superficial level. Uh, and I will say that 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 is me as well. When I started making escape rooms, I was straight into Geniali, which is the online platform that I use. It's kind of a, a presentation software with a branching logic to it. And I was, you know, even at uh, meetings, my team meetings now, when somebody suggests faculty development, I think, oh, I could do an escape room around that. But when you um, 
step back for a minute and reflect and learn a little bit more about the learning theories, you can actually be a lot more nuanced about the design of that escape room and how you position the escape room within a teaching session. So you move from being quite, you know, this superficial, I'm a teacher and I teach, to I'm an educator and I create the resources and environments that help people to learn. And uh, I think one of the mindset changes that I've had around escape rooms, I used to look at them like an activity. So I'm going to bring students in, we're going to run an activity. And now I think of it more holistically. It's actually, it's quite a rich uh, learning environment with so many things going on. So um, learning theories have allowed me to view it um, from a lot more angles. So for those of you that are quite familiar with learning theories, um, I would just maybe uh, kind of use this diagram to explain the different types of theories that exist. You have your uh, broad grand theories, and these are those overarching kind of umbrella um, approaches to learning that you'll see in the literature. And examples of that are behaviorism and cognitivism. So these are schools of thought around how learning takes place. And as the little, the first arrow on the right here shows, are uh, is that these um, these schools of thought around teaching tend to be um, very. Uh, you know, you, you could almost apply them in any situation. So, so say, for example, behaviorism there, and that is um, that learning happens, uh, there's a cause and effect to it. The teacher does something, the students respond. Um, if there's a reward for that, they will do it again. So uh, a classic one in medical education, we are, our students would be very achievement oriented. So it has to be, if, they, if you want your students to engage, you really have to offer a grade for it. You have to give them some sort of a, you know, here's your credit for this. It really motivates them. And grand theories, like I say, tend to be more generalizable, um, but they're, they're less supported by data in that it's harder to um, compare and contrast and say, well, this happened because of behaviorism and, uh, you know, I've applied behaviorism and this was the result. They, they, they're, they're, they're a little bit too broad and nebulous for that. And that's why we have these more specified focused learning theories. Uh, we have our mid-range theories and then kind of smaller and more context specific again um, are the micro level or personal theories. And these are the theories as we get more focused, they relate to a particular group of learners in a particular situation or a particular context. And oftentimes these ones are easier to research. It's easier to kind of dig into these um, more focused learning theories. So just to spend a little bit of extra time on, on why we might use a learning theory. Uh, and again, I know we have this theme of uh, escape rooms under the bonnet today. Now I'm going to sound a bit like a car salesperson here. I'm going to sell it to you. Why, why will we use a learning theory? Um, th th there's many reasons for that. And um, just to highlight what these are, what a learning theory does is it really helps to anchor you. So like I say, I, I could run off and create a geniality tomorrow and I'd get so excited about the design theme and the slides that I'll use and the pictures and the puzzles. But what the um, learning theory does is really asks me to focus on the learning itself. So we, we, we don't risk getting into the situation with our not so healthy muffin. We're really keeping uh, the learning front and centre. It would also allow us to uh, predict how learning might happen. So I will then think about what are my students going to do? How are they going to interact with each other? What sort of conversations will they have? You know, what sort of dialogue? How am I going to support the dialogue? Um, and on a similar note, then that allows us to tweak the learning process. So if we think about uh, experiential learning, that is, um, you know, Kolb cycle. With this theory, we understand that practical skills happen when a learner is given a chance to try something out and then reflect on it afterwards. So with that, the knowledge of Kolb cycle, it'll mean then that I'll be able to look at my escape room and think, hmm, can I get some reflection in here? Where will I put the reflection in? Learning theories also help us to situate our escape room in a broader context. So if we say that we're creating escape room um, that is looking at or, or harnessing cognitive load theory, then our escape room will situate within um, a, a family of uh, kind of interventions or studies that relate to cognitive learning theory. So it allows us to uh, help other people to access what we're doing and make sense of it. Uh, and again, allied to that, it makes it easier for us to carry out research. And I would say that 
you know, carrying out educational research, I, I would imagine that many of us that are here today, you know, we're busy in teaching roles, uh, you know, we're, we're maybe doing some research, but it, it can be quite difficult to do that. Uh, when it comes to escape games, uh, there's so much that we can do to expand our knowledge around that. And I do feel that if you have got a research project, it can sometimes be really fulfilling and refreshing um, and it sits really nicely with your day job as well. So uh, using uh, like pedagogical or learning theory frameworks will help us to tap into that. So I'm going to actually just recover this and I'm going to apply an example to it. And the example I'm going to use is the escape room and um, that we've been using here with our students. So I have um, with a team of medical students, we had nine medical students. Uh, we used design thinking and we built an escape room uh, on the Geniali platform that would allow our learners to engage with uncertainty. So we weren't so concerned with knowledge and content and you know checking off. Have they learned this item? Have they learned this? Um, concept. It was about bringing them in in a way that would actually, um, you know, give them a little bit of a shake, trigger a bit of uncertainty for them. They were put in with groups of students that they hadn't met before. Uh, there was a bit of a creepy background to it. There was lots of riddles and I'll just show you some of them there and puzzles and, you know, they were dropped into it really. And huge emotional roller coaster like there was enjoyment there was fun there was laughter there was frustration you could see you know when teams one wanted it, one team member wanted to do something and the other wanted to do something else the frustration that would arise from that but actually that effect of our emotional experience is very mirrored onto what we were trying to um, kind of simulate for them and so when medical students move from being in the classroom based setting into the hospital or clinical based setting, these are exactly the challenges that they meet. They have to work with teams that they've never met before. They have to work out their role in the team. They often don't get a lot of guidance and everything's very fast paced and urgent. So a lot, uh, you know, we were aiming to try and create something that was kind of a shadow or a mirror of what they will meet when they go into that setting. Uh, so we would debrief around that, talk about the emotions, talk about their responses and then talk about adaptive approaches to that uncertainty. So that was our aim for that escape room. Um, and you could just jump in and start making puzzles. Uh, but one of the things that we used to really support us uh, in our planning was um, the uh, learning theory community of inquiry. Now, this is a, a, an online um, pedagogical model. It's one of the most researched online learning theories that are out there. It wasn't an exact fit to, you know, for the get go, because um, generally community of inquiry tends to relate to text mediated or asynchronous discussions that happen over a course of time um, and hasn't hugely been applied in synchronous or group activities where everybody's in the room together. So we were a little bit out on the limb applying it. Um, but what it did do for us, it made us think about um, to create a genuinely effective learning environment, we needed to attend to social presence. We needed to make sure that the students felt um, uh, enabled to engage and interact with each other. Um, cognitive presence that we provided enough material for them to actually you know, really think about a topic, unpack it, pull it apart, have a little argument about it, reflect on what their take homes are. Um, and then the teacher presence as well, or teaching presence. How does um, how does the facilitator get involved? How do they design the escape room? What level of facilitation is required? Uh, but it's not just on the teacher, it's actually on the, the peers as well. And I think a huge amount of peer learning takes place in escape rooms as well. And this community of inquiry model really got us to think about that. So if we go back again, so we're just returning to that question, why might we use learning theory to build and run an education escape room? So when we took a community of inquiry, what it did was it allowed us to really think, ah, yes, we really need to promote online teamwork. And yes, escape games are really natural um, landscapes for teamwork, but what does that look like? How are we going to facilitate it? How are we going to make sure that somebody doesn't just come in and start pressing all the buttons and, and tearing on ahead? So it, it, it got us to really focus on those very specific questions. Um, it made us a uh, reason that breakout rooms were necessary. Um, you know, we were wondering what group size and uh, you know how to make up the groups. Uh, we ran it in teams. Would we curate the groups or allow them to self-select or would we put them in random groups? Again, community of inquiry um, urged us to think about these different things. 
we also looked at the different processes. So if you think to yourself, I'm going to support learning in an escape room, it, it's quite black box, isn't it? There's not a lot of guidance. There's, uh, you know, it's not, uh, it's, it's, it's imperceptible about how to do that. But when you have something like co uh, community of inquiry, you now need to know, ah, I need to think about the social presence and how they uh, connect with each other. I need to know how, how are they literally going to take this puzzle and use it and unpack it? And what are they going to take away from it? Uh, and how am I as the teacher uh, going to you know, get involved? How much or how little? Uh, so I'm not going to say it completely cleans things up, but it's almost like putting on some some night vision goggles. A little bit of the dark disappears away when you have a good framework uh, to help you with that. Um, we could use the existing community of uh, of inquiry research to inspire us. So uh, there was very little. I think we found one paper that was using community of inquiry uh, to create an escape room. Now there's there's quite a few more now, uh, but at that time we could only find one paper and we didn't know whether we were you know in the right space. But what we did do was tap into um, some of the community of inquiry uh, studies that looked at uh, multi-user virtual environments. Uh, so basically where um, learners were coming in online together and uh, using avatars to engage with each other. So we were inspired by some of the take homes from that research. Uh, and then that also meant um, we could then tap into that community of inquiry literature. So basically, if you want to uh, publish a study around this, um, you, you know, you, you come up with your paper and you say, well, this I could put this in a journal that is open to publishing around escape rooms, but it also opens up the door to journals that are really keen on community of inquiry. And then you can find that, you know, your paper sits with that. So uh, in medical education, we call it joining the conversation. You know, what conversation do you want to join? So using a, a learning theory helps you to join multiple conversations. And uh, so this, this slide captures then um, we applied community of inquiry, we play tested the game on several different levels, and then we actually um, carried out a, a data analysis. So basically we viewed back the videos of the gameplay, uh, we did focus groups afterwards and interviewed the students uh, in the focus groups about their experiences. And, and from there, we gathered how much of community of inquiry um, was coming through. You know, we set out to, to, to put it into the design, but was it working? Was it supporting learning? And um, could we see that? Could the students relate to that? So from there, what that allowed us to do was to create design principles. And these are um, a, a series of guidelines for anybody who wants to use community of inquiry in their own escape room. And uh, it's up, um, it's in perspectives on medical education, it's open access. And if you want to build your own escape game and use community of inquiry, I would absolutely be delighted uh, if you use those and found them useful. So, so that uh, is very much uh, community of inquiry is very much a digital um, pedagogy or a digital learning theory. Um, and I realise that many on the the call today, you would be engaged also in face to face learning. So we, we'll look at some of the learning theories that might apply in those settings too. But as most basic, uh, a learning theory uh, provides us with a way of looking at things. And, and oftentimes when you go into the literature, you'll hear people say things like, oh, you know, we used a lens of socio-constructivism or, uh, you know, we took a self-efficacy perspective. And this is just to remind us that even though in any kind of learning environment or learning session, there are multiple learning theories at play at the same time. But if we want to really uh, simplify and, and you know, kind of get rid of some of the noise that exists, it's useful to take, you know, a single perspective or maybe, you know, two different angles uh, it, with which that you look at the learning. So um, the ones, the learning theories that might be uh, kind of most useful and we'll start with the grand theories because escape rooms are naturally team based they really lend themselves to uh, constructivism or socio constructivism and this is the idea um, where uh, learning takes place through interaction and dialogue and so if we apply a socio constructivist lens to the design of our escape room it makes us stop and think about how exactly they are going to interact uh, and I you know it, it you know in talking to people who run commercial escape rooms, you know, they say, gosh, you have to have everything nailed down. You know, they run in and they try to pull things off the wall. And, you know, uh, I think the adrenaline bees up. So um, how do we get away from kind of very individual, individualistic approaches? How do we encourage them to either work as a team on our puzzle 
or, you know, engage in leadership and, you know, OK, so I'm going to do this, you're going to do that and, and then we're going to come back together. How will we um, organise the, the learning environment such that we can guide the, the learners in that? So what are the opportunities for the learners to collaborate and also what level of support will the tutor provide? I think as teachers, we often, um, you know, when you're in case based learning or a workshop, you know, we hover and we dip in and we offer advice um, and in escape games, uh, we can have a, a subtly different role um, and oftentimes we need to be less directive uh, and less kind of involved. But it does mean that we need to think about our hint strategies and how to support them if they are, you know, what 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 will it look like when they're completely blocked and they can't move forward and how will they get out of that? And, um, you know, what is the involvement of the tutor there? If we take a, a, a behaviourist perspective on our escape game, you know, you might think as they progress through, how are we going to keep them in? What what is the carrot that we will give them as they go, uh, or what rewards will the learners achieve for a successful outcome? Uh, and you'll see this a lot in the game-based literature that um, you know one of the motivating things is to have these mini wins in the game as you go, and they can be really small. So in our uh, digital escape game, every time they got a puzzle right, it was there was a pleasing sound like a bing and they were rewarded with a, a gold coin so we had a spooky creature would drop in give them a gold coin and when you had three of the gold coins that would be um, clues for your meta puzzle the, the, the final culminating puzzle so again those little and, and I, you know watching back the videos and watching them, they're delighted with this. You're like, oh my gosh, we got a coin, you know, and it's those like uh, little, like I say, carrots can really keep them hooked and engaged and interested. If we take a cognitivist approach, and that is the idea that um, learning is very much uh, kind of information processing and, you know, how we bundle the information, how we present the information and how the learner, what they do with that, how, the, how do they take that and use that uh, and kind of upload it in their own mental schema. So it makes us think about our content. So if we want our learners to uh, learn a new topic or revise a topic, how will we arrange that? How will we, um, first of all, arrange it in a way that attracts the learner's interest? Now, that is an in inherent uh, um, uh, benefit of, of, of escape rooms. They are naturally curiosity provoking. They're often very novel. So we don't have to work too hard uh, to gain our, our learners interest. Um, I do feel like if if we suddenly decided to teach our entire medical curriculum through escape games, they would lose a little bit of that cachet. So um, the fact that, you know, we, we're here and doing it uh, and, you know, uh, pioneering with it in our own uh, teaching and learning, it does give us that little sense of, uh, you know, novelty will help our learners um, be uh, interested and uh, kind of engaged with it. Um, how will the game support retrieval of ideas? And, and what this means, um, if you look at the evidence base around teaching and learning retrieval practice, where they engage with a material and then, um, you know, a couple of weeks later, a couple of months later, um, they engage in an activity that makes them go back and actually find that information and find that fact it's somewhere uh, lodged in their brain. How do they bring that forward again? Escape games can do that. So when you're designing your escape game, thinking about how is the knowledge linking back to what they've seen already and will they make that connection? Will they be able to retrieve the information and, and, and let it fit with the level lessons that they've had before around it. Um, adult learning, uh, again, with adult learning, it's about uh, recognising when you have learners, uh, certainly in higher education, that are a little bit further along. They have a set of life experiences and backgrounds and past qualifications that they like to tap into. I mean, the people that come to my diploma, um, they're busy. They're really busy. They do the diploma as a part time, but they keep their clinical jobs. I mean, some of them are consultants. Con consultants. Some of them, you know, I, I've had situations where they've left a, a, a class, gone out and given CPR and then come back in again and I'm like all oh, right okay yeah that, that that makes sense so there's all sorts of um, kind of things going on but for those types of learners the learning has to be relevant to them it has to be something that they recognize that is useful to them and even though in escape games we can be very fantasy driven and we can use a lot of imagination is there a way to just make sure that what we're doing is relevant to the learners and how does the, uh, the game relate to their prior experiences is it something that kind of um, corroborates or consolidates their previous experiences and if so um you know that's that's a great thing 
So we're kind of into the final slides here. Um, how would you use a learning theory to inform your educational escape room? So this is uh, one of the kind of the, you know the practicalities. How might you do that? First of all, uh, always start with the end. Uh, what is it that you want to achieve? So like I say, with my escape game or our escape game, uh, we wanted to do was create an effective, creepy, uncertain experience where the learners would feel a bit like, oh, what is happening here? So we weren't so concerned about the knowledge and the content, uh, but more about the, the player experience. Now, you might have a completely different goal for your escape game. And I know that everybody who's here on the call today, you're probably thinking about your own escape game or an idea that you have. What is it that you want to do? Uh, I, I think they're great for solving a problem or a dilemma in your teaching. If you have a tricky topic or you have a topic that can be a little bit dry or you know the learners just kind of skate past, this could be a really great way of um, positioning it in a different way so that it's interesting for them. Um, but it will change how you approach that. So for, for us at wanting to create uncertainty, what really appealed to us with community of inquiry, social presence uh, is very concerned with that emotional experience. If the students don't feel um, that they can connect with each other and share with each other, then it's very hard to achieve that effective learning environment. So what we wanted to do was to um, use that idea of social presence to make them, you know, feel uncertain, but then feel okay to talk about it afterwards. We didn't, you know, there's a sweet spot. We 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 didn't want to completely uh, terrify them. So that 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 would be my my first tip. So what is it that you want to achieve? And um, then, you know, go in, uh, dip your toe into the literature to find out what's out there. Um, the, the literature around escape rooms in education keeps growing and growing. And, uh, you know, I've been studying this area for about three or four years now. At the beginning, there really was very little there. Um, every time I go in and even just preparing for this session, I went in and had a little look and there's, you know, um, a bevy of new papers that have arrived as well. So, you know, if you want to find a, 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 a learning theory that might be useful to your context, I'd literally go into Google Scholar and I would say, you know, learning theory, escape room, and then whatever discipline that you're working in um, and, and, and uh, you know, see what comes up, see what other researchers are doing and, and look at the learning theories and say, well, actually, yeah, that, that could relate to my setting. That is something that um, could be applicable to my learners. Um, reflect on how the gameplay will support your learning outcomes, and that is, um, it you know, it's really key to think about um, what are they actually going to do? What are they going to do in the escape room? So, with your face-to-face -face escape rooms, there is scope there um, for practical skills and psychomotor skills, um, not so much in the di the digital escape rooms, um, but what what is it the learning outcomes for the session are so what do you want the learners to do and achieve by the end of the session so it's different from what you want to achieve you have a piece of your teaching that you want to kind of address and um you know augment or develop and then you're going to have your learner outcomes and how will the gameplay do that so um traditionally if you have somebody that wants to create an escape uh, room that reviews topics then your puzzles should probably align with that content area because they're going to spend more of their time engaging on the puzzle and um, you really getting into that nitty gritty of mapping your puzzles to your learning outcomes is a really useful exercise as well and then to, to feed all of these ideas and the thinking that you have um, into a lesson plan for the session uh, and that you know again I, I, I would imagine there's a lot of educators uh, on the call here today um, and you might say well do I need a lesson plan like it's an escape room that that's it it's uh, you know uh, self-contained well I would actually say uh, uh, one of the things I've really learned about escape rooms is that the, the game is just part of it. You know, uh, with any teaching session that we have, we always have this idea of, you know, how do we prepare for the session? And I will always encourage uh, my teachers to think about the learner, step into their shoes and um, what's in it for them. OK, so they are coming to the session and they might go, oh, yeah, this is kind of fun. But if they've got an anatomy exam on on Thursday or they're thinking about going out on placements the following week, they're like, oh, my God, they're making us play a game. You know, oh, oh, 
So, uh, you know, and again, there's not a lot you can do about that. You can't change the curriculum or change the schedule at that time. But what you can do is to uh, use your lesson plan to prepare for that situation. So, right, guys, we're coming in today. This is what we're going to do. Um, here's our learning outcomes. This is what it matches to. And then, you know, whatever instructions that you need, guidance that you need, um, all, all of that scaffolding, all of that supportive kind of, um, you know, instructions and pre-briefing can be really, really helpful. It can make or break a game. And then in your lesson plan, that also helps us to remember that a debrief is hugely useful as well. And if you're not debriefing after your escape game, I think you, you may be missing a trick there because um, a lot of the learning takes place in that debrief. Um, and I, you know, my background, um, you know, kind of started out in communication skills and simulation learning and it's all about the debrief and there's a huge amount of research in simulation based learning to show that you know we might think that the learning's happening uh, you know at the mannequin or in the the role play but actually it's happening in the debrief so the knowledge construction the meaning making the shared reflection the dialogue that's where all the good stuff happens so our lesson plan will help us to think about that and capitalize on that moment uh, and, and also to mop up you see if there's learning outcomes that were embedded in the escape room and you know five groups managed to get through but two groups did not can you use that debrief to safety net and to ensure that those learners are still able to grasp those learning outcomes that they haven't missed those learning outcomes and then finally um well i've said here to, to to talk to your learners and test it out i would actually involve your learners in designing the games as well i um you know <laughs> when i carried out the design thinking project with, with my medical students they were phenomenal absolutely phenomenal and design thinking is very much about um empathy with the end user and i think sometimes we as educators we can think like uh oh, i i i know what my students want and i know how they learn but my goodness i i, I didn't so whenever they came in and they said well this is how we use games and this is what you know this is what we would like and this is what works for us and uh, the students they actually did um, in design thinking there's a stage called empathy interviewing and our uh, students they went out and they talked to students that were actually on their clinical placement and asked them about the uncertainty they were feeling um, and how how would an escape game feed into this how, how would that help prepare you so people that are actually uh, right at the you know the the, the coal face of this uh, can feed into the design process and also the students that got engaged in, in creating the the um the escape room they learned a huge amount about uncertainty as well because in game design uh, you never quite know if it's going to work or not so you have to sit with a lot of uncertainty and um, creativity generates a lot of uncertainty so it, it, engaging your students from the get-go can be really useful um, and then, you know, if, if you don't have students on your team, I would still get them involved in testing it very early. So before you create this beautiful escape room and everything's very finessed um, that you, you you play test it quite early, um, maybe even just using the paper puzzles, trying them out as prototypes, uh, getting the learners in and saying, well, what do you think about this? Is it is it fun? You know, uh, how difficult is it? That's another thing that's very hard to predict without actually play testing it um, and understanding that your escape game, it's going to be iterative. So um, even with uh, lots and lots of playtesting when you release it and, and our escape game we haven't released it into the full um, medical school curriculum it's going in um, in spring 2024 I realize there's going to be a lot of um, data back from that as well and that will help us to iterate the game again in the future so I realize that's been a bit of a whistle stop tour uh, lots of information uh, coming that way um, you know you might ask how do I find out more about escape rooms from an academic perspective I think these are two fabulous papers and um, Alice Veldkamp et al uh, Alice I will say is an absolutely fantastic colleague she's been so inspirational in my own journey in escape rooms uh, and you know she's a fantastic systematic review that looks at escape rooms and education a really nice uh, solid foundational paper uh, and also Lini Tarleson has uh, another review around escape rooms coming at it from a slightly different angle and um, but again goes into the learning theories in a little bit more detail there 
If you want to know more about learning theories themselves, um, I love uh, the Learning Theory Simplified book uh, by Bob Bates. I pull that out nearly every day to have a little look. I, I don't know about the rest of you, but I, you know, I've been doing this for years and I still sometimes get confused between them. So I pull out Bob's book and I go back in and go, yeah, that's it. That's right. So a, a really uh, useful textbook uh, explained in lay language um, and something a little bit lighter touch on the left there. Uh, my brain is open. Uh, I think it's my brain is open dot net. Uh, if you Google it, uh, you should be able to find they have a lovely timeline of learning theory. So where learning theories emerged from their historical background and how they've evolved, uh, especially, you know, as we move into the digital era. So that's a nice light touch uh, and quite entertaining look at learning theories. Um, if you want to go a little bit more uh, in depth and more academic, now this comes from medical education, and I don't know how many of you on the call today are involved in health professions or medical education, uh, but this is really a seminal paper. Uh, how to use learning theories as conceptual frameworks. And again, with the lighthouse here, it's the sense of taking an angle. You're not going to actually light up everything, but you're going to take an angle and shine light on one particular area um, of your learning session. Uh, and again, reduce down that noise so you can really focus on what works. And I just saw recently that that paper, it's been voted one of the top five uh, medical education papers of all time. So, um, it's you know definitely something that 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 you might find interesting but yeah uh, questions i'm hoping some questions have popped up 